Hi, everybody. This is Gad Saad. Over the last uh, couple of days, I've received several tags from people who uh, wanted to alert me uh, to a letter that an irate, rightly irate, a parent at a posh New York school had written to the administration. Uh, I'm thinking that maybe he's been inoculated with this book right here. Let me read you his letter. Uh, the letter can be found at uh, Barry Weiss's uh, website. I'll put the link to it. And then there was a reply that I received uh, through WhatsApp from, uh, I guess, one of the administrators at the school in question. So I'll read both. And hopefully this serves as an example of what it means to activating your inner honey badger, because this particular parent certainly did. So here we go. April 13th, 2021. Dear fellow Breerle parents. This is the name of the school in question. Our family recently made the decision not to re-enroll our daughter at Breerly for the 2021-22 school year. She has been at Breerly for seven years, beginning in kindergarten. In short, we no longer believe that Breerly administration and board of trustees have any of our children's best interests at heart. Moreover, we no longer have confidence that our daughter will receive the quality of education necessary to further her development into a critically thinking, responsible, enlightened, and civic-minded adult. I write to you as a fellow parent to share our reasons for leaving the Breerly community, but also to urge you to act before the damage to the school, to its community, and to your own child's education is irreparable. It cannot be stated strongly enough that Breerly's obsession with race must stop. It should be abundantly clear to any thinking parent that Breerly has completely lost its way. The administration and the board of trustees have displayed a cowardly and appalling lack of leadership by appeasing an anti-intellectual, a liberal mob, and then allowing the school to be captured by that same mob. What follows are my own personal views on Breerly's anti-racism initiatives, but these are just a handful of the criticism that I know other parents have expressed. I object to the view that I should be judged by the color of my skin. I cannot tolerate a school that not only judges my daughter by the color of her skin, but encourages and instructs her to prejudge others by theirs. By viewing every element of education, every aspect of history, and every facet of society through the lens of skin color and race, we are desecrating the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and utterly violating the movement for which such civil rights leaders believed, fought, and died. I object to the charge of systemic racism in this country and at our school. Systemic racism, properly understood, is segregated schools and separate lunch counters. It is the interning of Japanese and the extermination of Jews, or the exterminating of Jews. Systemic racism is unequivocally not a small number of isolated incidents over a period of decades. Ask any girl of any race if they have ever experienced insults from friends, have ever felt slighted by teachers, or have ever suffered the occasional injustice from a school at which they have spent up to 13 years of their life, and you are bound to hear grievances, some petty, some not. We have not had systemic racism against blacks in this country since the civil rights reforms of the 1960s, a period of more than 50 years. To state otherwise is a flat-out misrepresentation of our country's history and adds no understanding to any of today's societal issues. If anything, long-standing and widespread policies such as affirmative action point in precisely the opposite direction. I object to a definition of systemic racism, apparently supported by Brearley, that any educational, professional, or societal outcome where blacks are underrepresented is prima facie evidence of the aforementioned systemic racism or of white supremacy and oppression. Facile and unsupported beliefs such as these are the polar opposite to the intellectual and scientific truth for which Brearley claims to stand. Furthermore, I call bullshit on Brearley's oft-stated assertion that the school welcomes and encourages the truly difficult and uncomfortable conversations regarding race and the roots of racial discrepancies. I object to the idea that blacks are unable to succeed in this country without, the, without aid from government or from whites. Brearley, by adopting critical race theory, is advocating the abhorrent viewpoint that blacks should forever be 
regarded as helpless victims and are incapable of success regardless of their skills, talents, or hard work. What Brearley is teaching our children is precisely the true and correct definition of racism. I object to mandatory anti-racism training for parents, especially when presented by the rent-seeking charlatans of Pollyanna. These sessions, in both their content and delivery, are so sophomoric and simplistic, so unsophisticated and inane, that I would be embarrassed if they were taught to Brearley kindergartners. They are an insult to parents and unbecoming of any educational institution, let alone one of Brearley's caliber. I object to Brearley's vacuous, inappropriate, and fanatical use of words such as, quote, equity, quote, diversity, and, quote, inclusiveness. If Brearley's administration was truly concerned about so-called equity, it would be dis discussing the cessation of admissions preferences for legacies, siblings, and those families with especially deep pockets. If the administration was genuinely serious about diversity, it would not insist on the indoctrination of its students and their families to a single mindset, most reminiscent of the Chinese Cultural Revolution. Instead, the school would foster an environment of intellectual openness and freedom of thought. And if Brearley really cared about inclusiveness, the school would return to the concepts encapsulated in the motto, one Brearley, instead of teaching the extraordinarily divisive idea that there are only and always two groups in this country, victims and oppressors. I object to Brearley's advocacy for groups and movements such as Black Lives Matter, a Marxist, anti-family, heterophobic, anti-Asian, and anti-Semitic organization that neither speaks for the majority of the black community in this country, nor in any way, shape, or form represents their best interests. I object to, as we have been told time and time again over the past year, that the school's first priority is the safety of our children. For goodness sake, Brearley is a school, not a hospital. The number one priority of a school that has always been and always will be education. Brearley's Misguided priorities exemplify both the safety culture and, quote, cover your ass, close quote, culture that together have proved so toxic to our society and have so damaged the mental health and resiliency of two generations of children and counting. I object to the gutting of the history, civics, and classical literature curriculums. I object to the censorship of books that have been taught for generations because they contain dated language potentially offensive to th the thin-skinned and hypersensitive, something that has already happened in my daughter's fourth grade class. I object to the lowering of standards for the admission of students and for the hiring of teachers. I object to the erosion of rigor in classwork and the escalation of grade inflation. Any parent with eyes open can foresee these inevitabilities should anti-racism initiatives be allowed to persist. Small interlude, it's as if someone has written an international best-selling book on this topic and has been warning people for two and a half decades about these issues. We have today in our country from both political parties and at all levels of government the most unwise and unvirtuous leaders in our nation's history. Schools like Brearley, are supposed to be the training grounds for those leaders. Our nation will not survive a generation of leadership even more poorly educated than we have now, nor will we survive a generation of students taught to hate its own country and despise its history. Lastly, I object with as strong a sentiment as possible that Brearley has begun to teach what to think instead of how to think. I object that the school is now fostering an environment where our daughters and our daughters' teachers are afraid to speak their minds in class for fear of consequences. I object that Brearley is trying to usurp the role of parents in teaching morality and bullying parents to adopt that false morality at home. I object that Brearley is fostering a divisive community where families of different races which until recently were part of the same community, are now segregated into two. There are, these are the reasons why we can no longer send our daughter to Brearley. Over the past several months, I have, forgotten, I have personally spoken to many Brearley parents, as well as parents of children at peer institutions. It is abundantly clear that the majority of parents believe that Brearley's anti-racism policies are misguided, divisive, counterproductive, and cancerous. Many believe as I do, that these policies will ultimately destroy what was until recently a wonderful educational institution. But as I am sure will come as no surprise to you, given the insidious cancel, cancel culture that has of late permeated our society, 
most parents are too fearful to speak up. But speak up, you must. There is strength in numbers, and I assure you, the numbers are there. Contact the administration and the board of trustees and demand an end to the destructive and anti-intellectual claptrap known as anti-racism. And if changes are not forthcoming, then demand new leadership. For the sake of our community, our city, our country, and most of all, our children, silence is no longer an option. Respectfully, Andrew Gutman. Mr. Gutman, you are my honey badger of the month. That's a big honor. Put it on your CV proudly. And this is a response that I uh, that a colleague of mine shared with me. Apparently, I haven't confirmed it, but it looks like it's on the Brearley uh, letterhead. So let me read you uh, their reply. Here it goes. Dear members of the Brearley community, today Brearley families received a letter from a Brearley parent. The letter then circulated among students, faculty, uh, and staff at school. Many have written to say that they found the opinions expressed in the letter to be deeply offensive and harmful, and we agree. They don't explain how it's deeply offensive. They don't exactly point to what Mr. Gutman uh, where he went wrong. This afternoon, I and others who work closely with upper school students met with more than 100 of them, many of whom told us that they felt frightened and intimidated by the letter. Remember my childhood in Lebanon when I didn't know if I would make it till the next five minutes because it was either snipers who were going to kill us, a bunch of militia who were going to kill us, the bombs that were raining on our house that were going to kill us, the stray bullets that were going to kill us, and that's just mentioning a small subset of things that were going to kill us. The genocidal hate that was going to kill us, that's nothing compared to the frightening, intimidating letter that this gentleman shared. That's what true victimology is. All those kids who might have heard of this letter are now scarred for life. many of whom they felt frightened and intimidated by the letter and the fact that it was sent directly to their homes. Oh my God, this is so frightening. Our students noted that as this letter, which denies the presence of systemic racism, crossed their doorways, the evidence of ongoing racism, systemic and otherwise, is daily present in our headlines. Well, I mean, that's exactly why, for example, LeBron James deserves, you know, a, you know the Presidential Medal of Freedom for being able to go to... Uh, the, the Lakers uh, center where they play. I can't remember the name of the place uh, because, you know, he, he's basically ducking and weaving the daily genocide that happens of black people in the United States. We express our unequivocal support for our black, Asian, indigenous, multiracial, and Latinx students, faculty, staff, and alums. Many of our students of color, especially those who identify as black, felt that the letter questioned their belonging in the Brearley community. It did no such thing, by the way. Their belonging and their excellence are unquestionable. We continue to move forward together to build an inclusive, anti-racist school in which all members of our diverse community see that their contributions are acknowledged, know that they are valued, and that they belong. But of course, not if they are white, in which case we teach the white kids that they are pieces of feces because, you know, bro, they're skin you. But other than that, the, the school is really in support of inclusiveness, diversity, and equity. Or as I like to call it in this book, the die religion. Brearley will continue to listen, solicit feedback, and welcome constructive criticism. I think this gentleman's letter was very constructive and very polite. From our students and our community as we challenge racism wherever we may find it. We all share responsibility in preparing our students for purposeful and meaningful lives. We are all expected to engage in this work with respect for one another. This letter failed both in content and delivery to meet that expectation. We are better than this and we must do better for our students. They are counting on us. Sincerely, Jane Fried. So note that there was no con there was no substantive content to her rebuttal. There was the fact that they were offended, they were insulted, they were made to feel unsafe. How a letter that is written in such polite ways can make someone feel unsafe? Remember my section on anti-fragility in the parasitic mind, right? If children cannot be sufficiently anti-fragile, 
that they could know of this existence, the existence of this letter, oh boy, they didn't really want to go through my childhood in Lebanon. So there you have it, folks. Uh, this parent did the exactly right thing. This is exactly what I've been imploring people to do. That's exactly what I mean when I say in chapter eight of the parasitic mind, activate your inner honey badger. He decided to take concrete actions. This has started a conversation. People are reading that letter. People are being emboldened. It, it just takes one little, the, the proverbial, uh, you know, batting of the butterfly wings that then results in a ripple effect. The silent majority, trust me, I receive innumerable letters from around the world every day. People in academia, in medicine, in dance, in fine arts, in, in, in culinary arts, in every imaginable setting where they are being completely squashed by the idea pathogens that I discuss in the parasitic mind, and yet they're afraid to speak. And again, it's unclear why they are so afraid. I understand that people are afraid for their jobs and being unfriended on Facebook and being ostracized by the cool, from the Cool Kids Club. But this gentleman, Andrew Gutman, didn't seem to care. Why? Because he was more indignant at what garbage his daughter was being exposed to than to actually engage in the modulation of, you know, uh, whether he's going to be loved by the Manhattan elite. And for that, I tip my metaphorical hat to you, sir, and you are uh, welcome on this show uh, anytime you'd like. I offer you my platform. You're my kind of fellow. I haven't met you, but I really like you. Have a great weekend, everybody. Cheers.